Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Ben um, is a, uh, a research faculty member at Harvard University. Uh, he did uh, his PhD at MIT under Ron Rivest. Uh, has done uh, a great deal of work on uh, verifiable voting technology and actually putting the rubber to the road and making it happen. Um, and if you uh, go watch his talk from uh, yesterday, you'll see he's done work in other areas also. But I, I won't get into that now. So uh, <laughs> pleasure to have Ben here. Thanks. I don't need this mic, right? This, this no, mic, this mic is enough. OK, good. Um, all right, so I want to talk about truly verifiable voting. And as I talk about it, you may hear me say the words open audit voting, because we've tried different terminology to talk about this new category. It's not new, but this different category of voting system. Um, and uh, open audit is meaningful, but it doesn't always ring a bell uh, immediately. So truly verifiable voting is a term that I think Ron has been uh, talking about recently. And so we're, we're, we'll try it, see if it works today. Truly verifiable voting. So the first thing I want to say is um, that there's, there's this uh, quotation from, that's been attributed to a handful of, of uh, famous cryptographers. And it goes something like this. If you think cryptography is the solution to your problem, then you don't understand cryptography, and you don't understand your problem. Now, I like this quote because it's true in many ways. Uh, but I like to start out with this quote because it's the kind of fight that cryptographers have to fight all the time when they try to say, no, really, there is some value here. There is, the, in a few cases, cryptography can actually make a qualitative change, a different kind of protocol, a new category of system. This is not about one voting system that's super cool. This is about a new category of voting systems that could really change the way that citizens audit their elections. And uh, to be extremely enthusiastic about it, this could change the way we've been doing elections since the beginning of time. This is a different way for a population to audit the elections that they hold. So the key intuition is that cryptography typically lets you solve problems that initially seem impossible. Uh, the classic example of that is public key cryptography, the idea that you can encrypt a message, but not have the ability to decrypt it. It is something that may be commonplace now, and because we all place orders on Amazon or use SSL websites, we think it's, it's commonplace. But it was not exactly the easiest thing to accept or the most intuitive thing to understand uh, when it became a more common topic. So cryptography solves problems that initially appear to be impossible. It doesn't solve all impossible problems. But there are some categories of seemingly impossible problems that it can solve. And like I said, there's a potential paradigm shift here, a means of election verification that is completely different, com way more powerful than anything uh, that we've used before. All right. I'll add one more detractor to this list because she is an extremely important player in, this, uh, in the voting game and somebody who's, I think, done a lot of good things for elections. And that's California Secretary of State Deborah Bowen. And in July 2008, she said, the problem with cryptography, this is slightly paraphrased, the problem with cryptography is that you're just moving the black box, right? Now, it's, you know, the cryptographers who, are, who hold the trust for the elections. And really, few people really understand it. Few people really trust it. And I understand that feeling. I'm going to try to prove to you that that's not quite true. And actually, cryptography really lets a whole lot of people audit the election. OK. One more small link to what's been said earlier today. How do you verify an election? And in one of the earlier talks this morning, we were talking about verifying the code of a voting machine, right? So if this is a timeline of an election and we have code in a, you know, uh, a DRE machine, and we would try to verify it with my little verification uh, uh, diamond here. So if we produce the code, we verify it. Well, if I'm the attacker, I'm going to attack right after you verify it. 
And if you're the person verifying, you're going to say, well, fine then. I will verify right before election day. And then if I'm the attacker, I'll say, okay, well, I will attack right on election day. And as a defender, you'll say, okay, I will verify right after election day to make sure you didn't tamper with the code then. And so on and so forth. And the point I want to make here is that if we're trying to verify the code that is producing the election result, we're going to keep playing this game of I'm going to sneak in an attack right after you verify it. I'm going to verify one more time. I'm going to sneak in an attack right after that. What we really want to be doing is not verifying the machine that produces the result. We want to be verifying the result. And with cryptographic voting systems, with these truly verifiable voting systems, we don't look at the machine. We look at what the machine produces. We look at the results that it produces. And in addition to just the raw count, the result is going to include some extra information. And together, the results and that extra information are going to be verifiable. So it doesn't matter when the attacker comes in. We're verifying the result, not the machinery that produced the result. OK, three points that hopefully you can take away at the end of this talk. Voting is a unique trust problem, absolutely different from a lot of other issues that we see in uh, security. Second point, cryptography is not just about military secrets. Usually that's what people think about. Cryptography, it's the business of spies, it's the business of encryption, it's the business of keeping things super secret. In fact. There's a whole area of cryptography, basically all of modern cryptography, which is not just about secrets. It's about collaboration without blind trust. People want, you know, we all want to accomplish certain tasks together, but we don't all have aligned interests. How do we collaborate in a way that we achieve our common goal, even if we might have other individual goals that are at odds with each other, which is basically all of human interaction, right? And voting is one of those things. We all want to come up with a result that is a democratic uh, result of what we all, with the person we want to see win the election. But of course, you know, if things kind of fall in the direction of my candidate and a few of the other parties' votes are not counted, maybe I don't mind. And if people in the other party, if the things go the other way, maybe they don't mind. So how do we collaborate to get to that fair result? That's what cryptography also enables, not just secrets. So that's the second point. And the third point is that all of this mumbo jumbo, all of this theoretical stuff, turns out is becoming practical. And that's kind of exciting. So let's dig in. Number one, voting is a unique problem. Who saw this movie? You probably don't want to admit it if you did. Who saw this movie Swing Vote with uh, Kevin Costner? Yeah. So. Uh, it's a terrible movie. It's really, really awful. I, I was watching it late one night. I, I, you know, found it on cable. That's about as much as I'm willing to admit. Um, and at the end of the, 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 the premise of the movie is that the entire election comes down to one guy, right? For reasons that I don't even understand. But this guy is going to decide the election, and he has, he has to revote, okay? And the last scene of the movie, after he's been courted by both parties is he goes to the precinct that's been opened for him. You know, they opened an entire precinct just so this guy could re-vote, because nobody else is re-voting, just him. And then, you know, he's been courted by both parties, and he goes into the, the booth, he turns around and smiles, and closes the, the, the curtain, <laughs> and then the movie ends. And you're like, he's the last person voting. He's deciding the election. What voter secrecy does he possibly have, <laughs> right? So. It's funny because it's so obviously stupid, right? But it, kind of, it gives you a hint as to the inherent difficulty of voting protocols. In certain cases, you will lose your privacy inherently. And so this is a stupid movie, but there are actually some real cases. This is from, I, I think, 2004. Um, small city, one guy running for, for mayor. His wife goes to city hall to see the election results and comes back and says, did you vote for yourself? She says to her husband, did you vote for yourself? Because there were zero votes for you. You got zero votes. So that's kind of interesting, right? Like, 
the guy detects that, oh, maybe there was an error because there are zero votes, and of course I voted for myself. But the more interesting conclusion here is, did his wife vote for him? <laughs> right? So, again, in these small sort of constrained cases, you start to see that the model of voting inherently leaks some information, right? It's a, you can't just simply say, everybody's vote will be private, and, and we're done, right? There are some subtleties to this, right? And these subtleties, I'm not giving you all of them, I'm just giving you the funny ones, right? These subtleties are what make the problem difficult. A lot of people will say, well, you know, every day thousands of people get onto these metallic tubes and they fly across the country and most of the time it goes really well and if we can get these airlines to work, can't we get these freaking voting machines to work? How hard can that really be? And then other people say every day there's hundreds of millions of dollars that are transacted and we all get receipts and everything is just fine. I get my statement at the end of the month. If we can get the banking system to work, how hard can the voting system be, really? And the point to remember here, whenever you hear these, because you will hear them about every other article that talks about this stuff, is that these are terrible analogies. And they're not, they're not just bad analogies in that ATMs and planes are vulnerable. Of course they are. Like every system, they have vulnerabilities. That's not the point. The point is that voting is actually much harder than either of those two systems. Why are those bad analogies? Well, think about the adversarial model first. Okay? I think the airline is on your side. I'm not sure. It depends. You know, sometimes when I fly, I, I think they're kind of working against me. But usually the airline is trying to keep me safe, right? You can't always say that that's the case with election officials, as uh, David talk, David's talk earlier proved, right? So on the plane, you know, you hope that the pilot's working with you and you hope that the, the airline's working on your side. Usually they are. In the banking situation, privacy is very different in banking than it is in voting. Banking privacy is entirely voluntary. If you want to post your data online, no one's going to prevent you. You want to post all your account information, you want to show people how much money you have, you want to prove to somebody how much money you have so they'll give you a mortgage, the system is set up so you can do that, right? In voting, you do not have the option to provably ver show your vote to somebody else. The system is supposed to prevent you from letting you prove your vote. Because if you can prove your vote, then you can sell your vote. And the system is set up so that you should not be able to sell your vote. So privacy is enforced by the system. It's not an option for you, or it shouldn't be. If you do remote voting, it's a different problem. And that's actually, huh? right, Re remote voting is, a, is, the reason remote voting is such a paradigm change in how we do voting is that privacy no longer becomes enforced by the system it becomes your personal option. And that really changes. Sometimes it's not an option because sometimes you're coerced. And that really changes the ballgame. But that's, that's a very important difference between banking and, um, and voting. Then, of course, there's failure detection and recovery. Okay, if a plane fails, generally we find out about it, right? If something goes wrong in your banking statement, generally you have ways to reconcile and figure this out. If something goes wrong in a typical election, Generally, you don't know. You know, if the vote is off by half a percent in a classic election on paper, you probably won't find out. Um, so, if you want to compare to banking and you want to compare to airlines, you have to imagine a bank where you never get a receipt for what you do, right? Yet you're still somehow able to get a mortgage, right? You, get a, you can't prove to anybody how much money you have or how many ass, what your assets are, but you can still get a mortgage. If you want to compare it to the airline industry, you have to assume the pilot's actually trying to crash the plane. So if you're willing to make those analogies, yes, voting can be compared to those two fields. But if not, then the, the analogies really break down, not in subtleties, they break down at a very deep level. And the key issue here is that when we're trying to have ballot secrecy and force privacy, that conflicts with auditing. Straightforward, right? You want to hide how people are voting, how do you audit the system? And the key idea behind the cryptography applied to voting systems is that we can solve this seemingly impossible problem. This problem of reconciling the secrecy of the individual ballot with the auditing is something that we can resolve with cryptography. How do we do it? 
Well, let's look at how elections used to be done before we had the secret ballot. The guy in the red shirt, hey, hey, I have a laser pointer, hold on. I don't know if uh, this shows up on the video camera, I hope so. But the guy in the red shirt over here is being sworn in by the guy in the blue jacket, and he's being sworn in to vote. Behind here, there are two people recording. This is like a uh, raid array from 200 years ago, right? Like two <laughs> disk drives, basically. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's what it is. Uh, and, uh, and the public here is watching, right? No secrecy. Very easily auditable, right? You can make sure that those guys recorded your vote the way you wanted to. The public can make sure that they recorded it the way they wanted to. They can keep track of their own count. Maybe the guy will get influenced. I mean, you know, everybody's watching him vote, right? But auditability-wise, this is a great scenario. Very easy to audit. So let's look at how it works today. First, we have a vendor who produces source code. Now, it may not be actual source code. It may be you know, a lever machine machinery. It doesn't have to be actual programming code. But it's some mechanism, be it software or hardware, that implements the voting machine. Then that gets installed in some way on the voting machine. Then the voting machine is delivered to the polling location. Then Alice votes on that voting machine. Then those ballot boxes are collected. And then they are audited, sorry, they are tallied into a result. Now, the first thing to notice is that very much unlike that scenario from 150 years ago, this process at the end there, the ballot box collection, is generally opaque to the public. The public generally does not see that happening. But even before you worry about this, if there's a problem in the source code, if there's a problem in the way the source code is installed on the voting machine, if there's a problem in the way the voting machine is delivered to the precinct, if there's a problem in the way Alice interacts with the voting machine, say with a device that has infrared like the Princeton team showed recently that somehow manages to you know, inject bad code into this voting machine, if there's a mistake at any of these steps, if there's a mistake in the ballot box collection, in Boston the way that's done is state troopers collect ballot boxes and bring them to one central location. Oh, you know, I like my state troopers as much as the next guy, but maybe they have a preference in the result of the election, right? And then finally, the tallying, which in a lot of large cities now is not really done in public anymore because it's just not feasible. So it's really done in a, you know, in a secret room with some party representatives, usually by putting memory cards in a tallying computer. If anything goes wrong at any of those points in the chain, the result is basically not trustworthy. The way that we've resolved the conflict between auditing and secrecy is to try to maintain this tight chain of custody from the beginning to the end. But the problem is, one break in the chain, and it doesn't matter how secure the rest of the chain is, you can't trust the result. So what happens because of this chain of custody? Well, in 2002, we found scavenged ballot box lids floating in the bay in San Francisco. Were these ballot box lids on empty ballot boxes? Probably, but maybe they were on real ballot boxes that had been dumped in the, uh, in the bay. Who knows? In Afghanistan, during one of the first elections uh, after the war there, one helicopter carrying a bunch of ballot boxes crashed. Probably not malicious, but what happened to those ballots? We break, we break that chain of custody. We don't know whose ballots those are, really. What do we do? Um, by the way, if there are questions, please, please feel free to interrupt me. I'm happy to take questions as we go. And I think time-wise, we're doing just fine. So, um, In 2004, 58,000 absentee ballots in Florida disappeared. Again, when you're relying on chain of custody and you lose something or something goes wrong in that chain, you, you cannot recover. You cannot recover from these failures. And then... Um, in 2006 in Mexico, they actually found filled out ballots in the dumpster. So that's just like, okay, you know something went wrong. Again, you can't, what can you do? You don't know whose ballots these are. Uh, in this case, you know it's not, it's not like the ballot boxes floating in the bay, which could have just been innocent. Clearly, this was not innocent. Uh, 
And yet, again, we don't know what to do. So the key question as a voter that you should be asking yourself in all of these discussions of chain of custody and whatnot is, where is my vote? Not just in Iran, right? If you're here in the US, after you cast your vote, where does it go? What happens to it? Is it getting tallied? You don't actually know that. So hopefully by this point, you're really depressed about how difficult voting is. Uh, and if so, that's what I generally do in my talks. In the first third of the talk, I try to depress you <laughs> about how terrible the situation is so that the solution looks that much better, right? Um, so now let's talk about the solution. Cryptography is, like, like I said, is not just about secrets. It's about collaboration between people who don't always trust each other on everything. So you don't have to blindly trust the people that are running the election. You can verify that they're doing things correctly. And that's what cryptography is meant to enable. Now initially, in the first voting protocols, uh, cryptographers simply recreated the physical process that we had in a digital world. If you're familiar with, digital, uh, with um, blind signatures, that was a little bit like the, uh, the double enveloping process that you do when you do absentee voting, right? Where first you take your ballot, you put it in one envelope, there's not, your name is not on that envelope, then you put it in a second envelope and you put your name on that, on that outer envelope. So you look at that, you say, ah, yep, okay, Benedita is allowed to vote, we'll open that, we'll take the inner envelope and throw it in a bin, and that's the bin of okay ballots, and then we'll shake that, that bin and open up those ballots. And the double enveloping process is meant to do this sort of first check the identity, then strip the identity, and then um, count. And initially, the, the, crypto, the cryptography was meant to re recreate that exact process. But then, eventually, there was this realization. And so far, I'm giving credit to almost nobody, but I have to at least give credit to Josh here for being uh, one of the first people who built uh, these types of protocols that said, wait, we can do something radically different here. We don't have to mimic the process that we have in, in you know, uh, in, in Adam's land, in, in, in you know, in in, uh, in physical land. We, in digital land, we can do something a little bit different, a little bit better. We can resolve secrecy and auditability, and here's how we do it. We start with the idea of the public ballots, right? Let's say that Bob voted for McCain in the 2008 election and Carol voted for Obama, we have some website in the sky that says Bob voted for McCain and Carol voted for Obama, and Alice comes in and says, I will vote for Obama, and we will tally, and it will be exactly like it was 150 years ago. Everybody can see who voted for what, everybody can count, you can check that your vote is properly recorded, everyone is happy. So we start with that, and then we just say, okay, well, if we encrypt these ballots, now notice I encrypted the ballots, but not the names, right? If we encrypt the ballots, do we ha can we do something here? In particular, if Alice chooses to encrypt what she's, the, the, the name of the person she's voting for and post it on this website, and Bob and Carol do the same thing, then all we need is you know, all we need in quotation marks is a mechanism for Alice to make sure that what is posted on that website is really the encryption of her vote. And then we need some mechanism to count things that are encrypted. And if we can resolve these two problems, then we're getting to a very, we're basically recovering the auditability of public elections but we've been able to sprinkle in the secrecy by having this combination of encryption of the data and proofs that the encryptions were done correctly and were counted correctly. That's the intuition. Because again, that middle part here, that website, is a public website. Everybody can see Alice and her encrypted ballot. And that is end-to-end -end verification, or open audit voting, or truly verifiable voting. And it looks like this. The vendor will produce some source code, which will be installed on the voting machine, which will be delivered to the polling location, which Alice will use. Her encrypted ballot will be posted on the bulletin board, and the results will be computed. And we don't care to verify any of that so far. What we do care to verify, one, Alice cares to verify that whatever's posted on that website is the vote she prepared in the booth. 
And two, all together, we want to make sure that this tallying happened correctly. But the source code of the machine, how it was installed on the voting machine, whether the voting machine was delivered untampered to the location, to the voting booth, we don't care. Because we're going to check the results after the fact. And that's going to tell us if things went OK. The side effect of this is that it democ Oh, I'm sorry, is that a question? Yes. Yeah, a question. Um, so it looks like in this model, Alice is the only one that knows what her vote was. Yes. So how, what if Alice decides she doesn't care, gets hit by a bus? How do we know? How does she know? How do we, there, like, let's say some of the problem breaks in one of these pieces beforehand, like you talked about. Right. Um, you've got a large margin of people that probably aren't going to check. Yes. So you're still going to get it away with. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, not everybody checks their receipt, right? Um, so the first thing, if you want secrecy, the first thing you have to accept is that the correspondence between what Alice wants, if she's voting for Obama, and the encryption of that, only Alice can check that. If somehow she, you know, before she actually casts that vote, she drops dead, pff, tough, right? But the second part of what you're saying is very important, which is what happens if she goes home but she doesn't care at, at, at that point? You know, she has checked that Obama was properly encrypted to one, two, three, seven, eight, whatever, but then she's not checking that her receipt properly appears on the bulletin board. Well, as it turns out, you only need a small percentage of voters to check as long as that's more or less randomly distributed in, uh, across the voting population to make sure that nobody cheated. Because it turns out that if you try to cheat, if somebody's trying to cheat uh, you know, any reasonable number of voters and you have a reasonable percentage of voters, you know, one or two percent that are actually checking their ballots, then there's going to be an intersection there. You can catch it, you can investigate it, and you can get recourse. That's the first answer, the sort of purely mathematical answer. The second answer, which is more process oriented, is that Alice doesn't have to do the checking herself. There can be party representatives at the, at the um, she, can, she doesn't have to do the second part of the checking herself. There can be party representatives at precincts where Alice will come out with a printed receipt that has her encrypted vote on it, and she can literally drop it off with a, a party representative she wants, of the party she, tr she trusts, and says, please check this for me. Right? And you can basically offload that to a third party. And that's actually a, a very important because I think in practice that's mostly what will happen. The average voter will not, you know, the, the, the crazy voters like me will verify their own votes. And the average voters will just say, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, like somebody else can do it for me, my favorite party or what. Andy. So the last part is kind of hard for people to get their heads around. I think you've done a fine job, but I just wanted to comment on the statistical checking. And in fact, that happens now with, with, with ballot audits, because when we do a hand recount of, of elections, there's only a fraction of the precincts that are, that are selected to do that. Yeah. It's the same basic principle that, that you can get extremely high confidence that the whole thing has been done correctly by looking at a small subset as long as you, you pick, pick that subset randomly. Yeah. So the notion that every single voter has to do this is far from, from true, just so long as Somebody, the, the only way this would break apart is if somehow, magically, someone breaking, uh, someone trying to tamper with the election could know in advance exactly which voters would check and which voters wouldn't. Right, and that's actually something to worry about. I, I, wanna, I think Andy's absolutely right. He's, I don't know if the mic is picking up what he said, but basically he's, Andy is saying that uh, just like when we audit uh, ex existing elections by looking at a subset of the precincts, you know, we don't need to audit everything to gain confidence. I would say that's true. I would emphasize that uh, the bar for these systems, I think, is higher. We, we want to be much better than the auditing of these current systems. Uh, but and as Andy has pointed out in one of his early papers, and other folks have followed up with that, when you're doing the random selection on a per voter basis, as opposed to on a per precinct basis, the numbers work out very nicely in the sense that because you're dealing with larger overall numbers, you you need a small percentage. Uh, you need to check a small percentage to get a statistical uh, uh, guarantee or high confidence that you're going to catch a cheater, basically. Uh, yes, right here. Are you going to talk about the effects of coercion on this model? I think yes, but can you be a little more well, precise? It looks like, naively, it looks like they're, right, if Alice is willing to say prove that she encrypted something like by opening the encryption to someone. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So she, it, the system has to be such that she cannot do that. Right. She has to be, she has to receive a proof 
that she trusts, but that she cannot transfer to a third party. So I will absolutely, I will absolutely address that. Yeah. yeah. And if the encryption's on the bulletin board, and she has the private key. Yeah, that's not how it works. Yeah, okay. that, that would not okay. work that way. That's a good point. Okay. That's actually a very interesting point, which is if Alice has all the data that she needs to prove to somebody that that number up there is the encryption of Obama, then we have no secrecy. Well, we have, we have optional secrecy. She could choose to reveal that to somebody else. So it, the system has to be such that she's convinced of that, but she can't transfer that proof. Yeah, and I'll tell you about that, definitely. Yeah. Maybe the same issue. If you can go to a party headquarters and to, to audit, you have to audit against her intention. And yeah, no, nobody can audit against your intentions. Only you can audit against your intentions. Then I can't, how do I outsource it? I'll show you. You, you don't outsource the whole thing. Mm. You do one small piece yourself, oh. and then you outsource the rest of it. And I'll show you how, how that happens, yeah. Okay. The, the important point here is that this democratizes the audit process. Right now, who gets to audit in elections? Party officials, maybe, and even then only certain parts of it, right? But this means that anybody with the skills to look at the protocols or with a friend who's got the skills to look at the protocols or with a friend who's got a friend who's got source code that they trust that you can run to verify this can be part of the audit process. Suddenly you don't need privilege to audit, you just need a little bit of knowledge. And that I think is actually very powerful. So when Deborah Bowen talks about moving the black box, it's true, it's not really a black box, it's moving the audit right from a, a number of people who are in a position of privilege to people who have a little bit of knowledge. And that, I think, is much more democratic uh, because anybody can gain that knowledge. Thus the term open audit or truly verifiable. So I want to I want to nail something in again before I get a little more technical here. Uh, there was an article written by The Economist about some of these systems in which I appeared and a few other people uh, in this field appeared and, and this was the title of the article. A really secret ballot, right? Cryptographic voting is about a really secret ballot. No, it's not about a really secret ballot. We're not changing the secrecy aspect of the ballot. We're changing the auditing aspect of the ballot. So the cryptography is not being used to get you more secrecy. It's being used to get auditing while maintaining the secrecy. So we work with encrypted data in public. The idea is we use encryption so that we can expose more of what's happening. It's a little bit of a you know, non-intuitive thing. You're using encryption so you can put the data out there and then prove stuff about that data. So let me tell you about a few technical components that go, that go into play here. And hopefully yeah, with this 10 minute crypto introduction you'll know everything you need to know. The first is randomized encryption. Public key encryption says you've got a public key and an associated secret key. You take a piece of data, like the word Obama, you encrypt it with a public key, you get some gobbledygook, and later you can decrypt that with the secret key. But if you have the public key, you don't have the secret key, so you can only encrypt. That's the first part of it. Randomized encryption means that there is some randomness that's being sprinkled into this encryption process. So that the next time, you know, if you encrypt McCain, of course you're going to get something different. But even if next time you encrypt Obama again, you're going to get something different still. Both of the first and the third will decrypt to Obama, effectively removing the randomness from there. But there's extra randomness inserted into the encryption process. Why? Because typically you're voting for two candidates. And if two candidates yield two ciphertexts on the bulletin board, it's pretty easy to determine, ah, all those people voted one way, all those people voted the other way. Well, clearly this person's clearly voting Democrat, so all those folks voted for Obama, and all those folks voted for McCain. So you need randomized encryption so that every encrypted message looks different, even if two of them are for the same uh, candidate. This, the same. Sorry? Your barcode graphics for the encrypted balance are all the same. <laughs> I was not expecting you to have a barcode reader in your brain, but uh, that's... Uh, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. That's true. Well, that's just me being lazy and not getting more than one, but one graphic. <laughs> um, so 
So this is a key idea. This is a, a fairly straightforward cryptographic concept, but in my opinion, uh, the voting setting is the, the best example of why this is a useful cryptographic tool. The idea that you need to randomize uh, the outcome, because in this case, you're only encrypting one of two possible strings, Obama or McCain. The second concept is threshold decryption. So I told you there's a public key and there's a secret key. But it's probably not a good idea to give that secret key to one person who then has the power to decrypt everything. What you want is to split that into multiple trustees so that they all need to sort of turn the key, you know, push the button at the same time to allow for decryption to happen. And the way that works is you take an encryption, you decrypt it with the first secret key share, you get what looks like more gobbledygook. The same thing with all four shares in this case, you get four pieces of gobbledygook. And then when you combine those four, then you get the decryption. But if you only had three of those four, you would have nothing. So you need all four trustees in this case to be able to decrypt something. That's pretty important. Anyone can encrypt, but those four trustees need to come together to perform the decryption. Is that clear so far? I'm just sort of building up the blocks. Referring to for the trustee piece, are you looking at like party officials or yes. what kind of person? For example, it could be like a, a representative from each party. And you'll see in just a second what role they will play in this respect. But yes, that's, that's a good model. One person for each party. It doesn't have to be four, of course. It could be ten. All right. So that's two building blocks. The third building block, which is not used in every voting system, but which is used in uh, some of the first, including Josh's uh, uh, seminal scheme in, uh, uh, a few years ago. Homomorphic encryption is a big word, but actually it's, it's a very simple concept. The idea is that if you take the encryption of one message and you more or less multiply it by the encryption of another message, you get the encryption of the sum. This is, this is a little bit crazy. What it means is that even though you're dealing with these so-called gobbledygook messages, you can combine them and have mathematical operations happening under the covers of encryption. So what's particularly interesting here is there's an addition going on here. And when you're thinking about summing up votes, that should start to ring a bell and go, oh, maybe we can do something interesting if we're able to add things without decrypting them. In particular, if you think about voting for Alice or Bob, let's say you only have two candidates, and you decide that a vote for Alice is going to be the encryption of the number one, and a vote for Bob is going to be the encryption of the number zero, then if you have all of these encryptions, an encryption of one for Alice, an encryption of zero for Bob, and you don't know what they are because they're encrypted, you can actually combine them with this homomorphic property and sum up those ones and zeros and at the end, you get the number, the encryption of the number of people who voted for Alice. I'll tell you a little bit more in just a second. Intuitively, if you want to know how this works, it's pretty straightforward. Somewhere under there, there's some exponents that when multiplied are getting added in the exponent. That's all you need to know for, about the math. There's a few more details, but that's basically what's going on. So we can add under the cover of encryption. This is fascinating stuff. It's one of the pieces about this that I love the most because it's just so simple and elegant. So this is one way we can do tallying. I'll tell you, you know, actually I don't know if I have, I may not have the other slide in here, but so if you have any questions about this, maybe you want to ask, ask them now. Um, if the adding of stuff didn't make sense, let me know. No? Paul, you want to? Uh, I'm Okay. <laughs> Please stop me. Please stop me. I, I am trying to throw sort of a lot of stuff at you, mostly to give you an intuition of how these things work. Uh, but it, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to pack it all in. All right. So the key thing to remember here is that even though we don't know what each individual vote is, we have this ability to do summing on these encrypted votes. And then if we have this ability, then the only thing we have to decrypt is really the sum. Right? And that's where that threshold property comes in handy because the party officials will agree not to decrypt individual votes, only to decrypt the tally. And as long as at least one of them is honest and says, no, I refuse to decrypt an individual person's vote, then you're good. So that's one way to do things. But you know what this doesn't support? What does this not support? 
key to decrypt the, the, the tally. That's true. There is the issue of how do you assign the threshold keys for decryption? Or, you, or maybe you're asking me. Or, yeah, no, that was right. Yeah, so that's, that's definitely one of the issues. But I'm going to consider that orthogonal because that happens all the time. You have to make a decision about whatever scheme you choose for uh, summing up the votes, you still have to decide who gets to decrypt. So that's not specific to this system. The specific issue with this system is you can't do write-ins. Right? You have to have predetermined candidates ahead of time so you know whether, you know, who gets a one and who gets a zero. So if you want to do write-ins, you have to do, you have to use a different support, a different mechanism for tallying votes. And that mechanism usually is a mixed net. Now, you don't have to understand the details of this. What this is trying to recreate digitally is shaking the ballot box. You put a bunch of ballots in a box, we shake them, okay? But the problem when you're trying to do that with digital data is that Remember I told you we're using randomized encryption, so all those ballots are unique. So it doesn't matter how often you reorder them, they're unique. It's pretty easy to pick out the ballot no matter how much you shake it, right? So in fact, to shake encrypted ballots, you have to transform them as you go. You can't just reorder them because they're data. They're not undifferentiated envelopes. So as a result, we have a bunch of schemes that are mixed nets, which ne there are networks of mixes, basically, and one way that you make this work is instead of having your ballot be the simply the encryption of a message, you wrap it in multiple layers. First, you encrypt it with the public key of this last mix. Then you wrap that in the, with the encryption of the middle mix. Then you wrap that again with the encryption of the first mix. It's like an onion. And in fact, some people call this onion routing. So you first wrap it with one key, then with another key, then with another key. And then when the message comes in at the beginning here, this mix server will be able to unwrap the first layer, peel the onion one layer, and when it comes out at a different location, because it's been peeled, it doesn't look the same, and you can't tell where it went. And then the second layer will do the same thing and take off another layer, and the third server will take off the final layer, and out comes the vote at the end, decrypted. There are many other schemes for doing this, some of them have much better properties than what I just described. This is just the simplest one to describe mathematically. And, but the idea is this. You have a bunch of servers, and each of them is doing a little bit of mixing. And the reason you have a bunch of them, by the way, is because if you had only one, then that one would know who voted for what. So when we were talking about the trustees, they apply here too. In this case, you would effectively have this be the Democratic Party, this be the Republican Party, this be the Green Party, and such, and each one would get to unwrap one layer. And the nice thing about this is that the, in, the ballot on the inside can be anything you want. So it can have a write-in, for example. It doesn't have to be just a, you know, a number the way the homomorphic systems have to, to work because they get to be added up. So I just told you how to do this, but I didn't tell you, for example, how to prove, well, I, I told you how to do the tallying I didn't really tell you how to, how to prove to Alice that her vote was properly encrypted. In fact, I didn't even really tell you how to prove that the MixNet did its job correctly, right? How do you know that these mixes did their job correctly? That part I'm going to punt on for now because it turns out to just be a, a whole bunch more math and the homomorphic approach uh, actually doesn't need any proofs in the tallying part because everybody can redo it. Anybody can take those two encrypted messages and combine them. So you don't really need a proof for that piece of it. Uh, I'm going to hand wave on the mix net. Uh, and Andy, you have a question? Or? Well, even in the homomorphic case, you have to, you have to prove the final decryption. Right? Yeah, right. So I'm punting on the, on the final decryption proof because it's the piece I have, the, the piece that's a little more complicated. Uh, There's, I'm, yeah. I'm, just, I'm sorry, I'd just like to clarify punting here. You're not saying that, that well, we'll I will clarify. Do it. I am punting. But the systems do it. I'm punting in the explanation, absolutely. Yeah, there, there are ways, so in the homomorphic scheme, right, Everybody can do the summing up, but then the trustees have to do the decryption at the end. And the question that Andy's bringing up is, how do you know the trustees are decrypting properly? Right? Maybe they're telling you that the sum is Obama 13 and McCain 11, but maybe it's the other way around. So there is some mathematical proofs that go along with those decryptions. I'm not addressing them here because they're just a bunch of math, and they're not the most interesting part of this. They don't give you the right intuition. Uh, I want to show you a different proof just to give you an idea of what these proofs look like. Uh, and then if we have time, I'll tell you about the decryption proofs. So the main intuition 
from modern cryptography that applies to elections is not what I've told you so far. The main intuition is the zero knowledge proof. And it has to do with the question you were asking regarding how do you give Alice proof that this is indeed her vote, but she doesn't have proof. She doesn't have the information to actually prove it to somebody else. It's this extremely non-intuitive thing, except hopefully after I show you this brief idea, you'll, you'll have some intuition for it. Imagine that Alice goes into a private booth with another person, and the goal of this interaction between Alice and this election official is that Alice will come out with a sealed envelope, sealed and signed by the election official, that she is confident contains the word that contains Obama, right? But she has never actually seen the contents of that envelope. Here's how you would do it. You would tell, Alice would tell the election official, I would like to vote for Obama. The election official will produce 10 envelopes. Alice doesn't see what's in the envelopes. She just sees 10 envelopes sealed and signed by the election official. And the election official says, these 10 contain Obama, I promise you that. And Alice says, really? Well, how about you open these nine for me? And Alice chooses which nine envelopes out of those 10 to open. And the election official will open them, or Alice will break them open, and they will all say, vote for Obama. Now at that point, Alice decided which envelope not to open, that singular envelope that has not been opened. Right? She chose the one that wasn't opened. So if this were you, if you were Alice, would you be relatively confident that that 10th envelope contains the word Obama? Maybe 10 is not enough for you. Maybe you'd rather have a million envelopes and you open all but one. And then if all of them say Obama, then you're pretty confident that that last one says Obama. And you never saw what went into that envelope, right? You didn't see what went into that envelope. That's pretty interesting. This last envelope probably contains Obama. Now we're going to mix it up a little bit more because that's not quite enough. Because if you come out of the booth with that one envelope that you think contains Obama and all these open envelopes that all say Obama, you kind of have evidence to show somebody and say, this is what happened, right? Look, I have all these Obama envelopes that are open. Clearly, this 10th one probably contains Obama. So the election official is going to throw in a little curveball here. And on your way out, the election official is going to give you nine open envelopes that say McCain. So now you come out of the booth. You've got nine envelopes that say McCain, nine envelopes that say Obama, and the 10th envelope that you know probably says Obama because what did you see? You saw the order of events. You, you know that you had 10 envelopes, you selected nine to open, they all said Obama, and only then did you get the nine fake envelopes from McCain. Because of the order of events that was done in this private booth, you are convinced that this last envelope contains Obama, but you come out with evidence that could prove it either way to somebody else. This is not how the algorithms actually work. This is a representation, this is an idea of how these protocols work. This particular method is called cut and choose in zero knowledge proofs because you get to choose which one you keep and you get to choose which ones to audit. But hopefully this is giving you an intuition of the fact that it's possible if you have an isolated setting between the person proving something to you and you, it's possible to prove something to you that you are very confident about. But then when you come out, you don't actually have the data to prove it to somebody else because you've actually got fake data that could prove the other case. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, I have a, a version with a little bit more math here, but I think I'm going to have to skip it and I'll come back to it afterwards if we have time or this afternoon if people want to dig into this uh, because the it turns out the math is not very hard, but uh, it, it would take a little more than the time we have left. I want to tell you very briefly about the systems that are, in, that are starting to come out that actually implement these types of things. So popping up a level for a second, what did I tell you so far? I told you that there are ways of publishing encrypted ballots so that you can prove how they are tallied even though they're encrypted. And you can prove to individuals that their vote was properly encrypted. And that creates this interesting auditing 
end-to-end -end trail, that means you don't have to trust any of the software. You just have to trust the output. What's on that website? What's in the proofs? That's pretty powerful. So the experience for the voter is that they will, in the, in, in the digital case, there's digital cases, there are paper schemes that you'll hear about this afternoon. In the digital case, you're interacting with a voting machine. You end up with an encrypted vote receipt, which I think is, once again, the same barcode. But uh, you get, no, different? OK. All right, good. Uh, so this encrypted vote, uh, is you walk, it out, you walk out with your receipt. It's not a receipt of how you voted. You can't show it to somebody and say, see, I voted for Obama. It's a receipt that contains your encrypted vote and probably a hash of it with a tracking number so that that becomes your tracking number. You go home, that's your tracking number. You look up on the website that your name and your tracking number appear properly. And then all of these are posted. And you can give a copy to one party. You can give a copy to the NRA if that's your favorite political organization. They can check it. Or the League of Women Voters if that's your favorite organization. They can check it. You can give a copy of this receipt to as many people as you want. That's the electronic experience. High level, there's a few paper-based ballot schemes. You'll hear a lot more of this from Ron this afternoon. I, I do not want to steal his thunder. But the general idea is that instead of doing encryption in these paper schemes, we, we, we pre-compute the encryption for all the possible candidates. And we have some paper-based indirection where the order of the candidates might be different from ballot to ballot. And then we tear the left side from the right side. And, or we separate the top layer from the bottom layer. And that separation is what effectively causes encryption. Because you no longer have the link as to, you know, if you just have this piece right here and a check mark in the first position, you don't know if it was David, Adam, Bob, or Charlie, because that order of candidates changes from ballot to ballot. And really, it's this identifier at the bottom that contains the encrypted material that tells you what the order was on the left-hand side. I'm glossing over this. I just want to give you an indication that you don't necessarily need to do this with computers. There are some very interesting paper-based schemes. And the most interesting one that Ron will talk about this afternoon that I'm, I'm not talking about here. So this is closing in on practicality. Another piece of the puzzle that I want to give credit to Josh for that's causing this to, to close in on practicality is the casting protocol that he's proposed. And I wanted to make sure that there was some time for me to present this. I told you that there's a way for the voters to interact with the voting machine so that the voting machine proves to the voter that their vote was properly encrypted. The realization that Josh had, and I think he's absolutely right, is that most voters are never going to do this. Most voters can barely deal with the voting process as it currently works. So the idea that on top of selecting a choice, they're going to have to begin a protocol with the machine to, pro to, to prove this. I think some voters will do that. And in that case, Andy's got some fantastic protocols that work really well. But can we do things so that most voters never have to care about this part of it? And Josh's proposal is that you split the ballot preparation and casting process into two steps. You have one machine that will prepare the ballot for you. And then you'll walk over to the other machine where you will identify yourself only then and cast that ballot. What it means is that you have a ballot generation machine that doesn't know who you are. And as a voter, all you do is you, you, you say, I'd like to vote for Obama. You get an encrypted ballot. You don't know that it's an encrypted ballot. It's a piece of paper with some gobbledygook on it, a tracking number, and you walk it over to the casting station. But before you printed that ballot, the machine gave you two options, confirm or audit. And as a voter, you just confirmed and went on your merry way. But if you're an auditor, and the machine doesn't know because you didn't authenticate yourself, right? If you're an auditor in the crowd coming up to the machine, the, the voting machine would effectively commit, produce some commitment on the screen that this is the encryption of the ballot. And then you would get to cast it or audit it. And if you audit it, the machine has to prove to you, has to print out all the details about how it prepared this ballot. And then you would check that, and then you'd be happy with your audit. Or you could just actually cast it, and then you'd get the, the full piece of paper signed by the voting machine. You're ready to go. You take this over to the scanner. I guess Ron would be the scanner in this case. And Ron will scan your ballot and decide, yeah, this is a good ballot, and record it. And the fact that you can do one or the other, which is another 
kind of uh, cut and choose approach, right? Means that you can intermix auditors and voters in the booth, in the booth, sorry, in the precinct. And the average voter doesn't have to deal with any of the complexity. But the Democratic Party and the Republican Party can send auditors to every precinct, and their jobs are just to go up to the machines, toot, 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 audit, use their personal scanners to make sure that the thing created the right audit trail over here, and then report to their central website, the Democratic Party audited this precinct at this time and all the machines checked out. It's not as direct a proof as the stuff you'll find in Andy's work, but it's already some pretty darn good assurance that those machines, during election day, interweaved with real voters, were doing the right thing. So there are many more great ideas in this field. There's uh, Andy's Mark Pledge, which is uh, uh, one of the coolest protocols for these interactive proofs that extremely, is extremely efficient. And as a voter, you only have to verify three characters or so that match between the screen and your receipt. That's, it's, about as, it's as efficient as you can really get if you want to do this interactive proof. There's some great work by Peter Ryan in paper-based schemes with prêt à voter. Some really interesting work on single transferable voting uh, by, uh, by Vanessa Teague and Josh and uh, Tal Moran uh, in, uh, in handling complex election styles. It turns out that single transferable votes, uh, you know, if you want to do the homomorphic tricks I talked about for single transferable votes, that's pretty complicated. Um, and the problem is that single transferable votes include a lot of information, right? If you have 10 candidates and you rank them all, that's a unique ballot. And nobody else is going to rank those 10 candidates the same way as you. So if you reveal the full ballot at the end of the day, you've probably lost some voter privacy. So doing single transferable voting right is extremely difficult. Uh, and there are some very interesting protocols uh, in, in, in this area. And then there's Scantegrity 1 and 2 that Ron will talk about this afternoon, which is trying to do cryptographic voting with a model that looks a lot like OpScan voting right now so that to the average voter, they don't have to deal with a whole lot more complexity. All these ideas are super cool, very interesting. If you like this stuff, you should absolutely dig in. Uh, there's three deployments that have happened that you should know about because these things are happening. The third one, I don't know much about, but I've been told that there's a, a, like an 8,000 voter election in Eastern Europe uh, in a system called Scratch Click and Vote, not to be confused with the system that Ron and I worked on, Scratch and Vote. It's not the same system. Uh, this, we do not get any credit for this. Uh, but I'm only starting to get some information about this. I actually don't, don't know all the details yet. Uh, the biggest, huh? <laughs> it's an online election with a combination of paper and on. Oh, I don't, I actually don't know. I just started to get some information about it. I, I, I put it on there to show that there's some stuff happening, but I need to do a little more work to, to figure out what actually happened. The, the biggest news, I think, in uh, deployments is that, and you'll hear from Ron this afternoon, that one of these systems was used in an actual municipal election in the US. This is huge news. Uh, there was an election based on a voting system of mine in Belgium for the president of a university, not the student president, the president of a university uh, in, with 25,000 voters. And I'm sure I'm forgetting some cases uh, of elections. Andy, am I forget? No? OK. OK. So my three points. Voting is a unique trust problem. I hope I convinced you of that. Cryptography is not about secrets in this case. It's about auditing. Don't think about it as a military technology at this point. It's about auditing. And we're starting to get to practicality, which I think is, is very important. And I'll leave you with some editorial comments. My fear is that computerized voting is inevitable. As much as we are fighting it, as much as we're trying to do something to prevent the dumb computerized voting, it's happening. And without true verifiability, that's going to be an ugly, ugly situation. So that's my fear. My hope is that these public auditing proofs, which really are revolutionary in citizen involvement in elections, that they will become as common as public key crypto is now. I'm pretty sure that Ron can tell us some stories about how unlikely it seemed for, that, for public key crypto to be a mainstream technology 30 or 40 years ago. Well, 30 years ago. <laughs> 40 years ago was really unlikely. <laughs> but 30 years ago, it probably seemed quite unlikely. And now we're all using it. So my hope is that these auditing pro protocols, which are more complicated and re require more public understanding than public e-crypto, so it is a challenge, 
But my hope is that they become as widely adopted as public key crypto is. And then the final challenge, the final question is, as we fight for all of this, are we facing a world where the privacy of the voting booth is no more anyways? And this is a, you know, on all the buses in California, don't wait in line, vote by mail. We're closing in on the vote by mail numbers in California that we see in, uh, in Washington and Oregon. Uh, and we have folks like Ed Felton who are making statements that I, I tend to agree with, although Ed and I don't agree on everything. Uh, with camera phones, with video phones, with all the technology that we all have, do we have any more voter privacy in the booth? And I don't know. And then, of course, everybody really wants to be voting on their cell phones. So that's yet another issue. Thank you. If you have any questions, let me know. Yes. Yeah, with this book by mail, I've heard no mention of the post office has been corrupt. And if you search after the precinct, they don't pick up your ballot and deliver it. Right. So the interesting thing is, if, if you took vote by mail, so you were, you were saying for, for people who are not, didn't hear you on the mic, that uh, in the case of um, vote by mail, what about corruption of the election officials? And I think that's absolutely right. That's a problem in every election system. But you could apply verifiable voting techniques to that portion of the vote by mail, right? You could get a tracking number for your vote, and you could check that the tallying was done correctly. But again, with vote by mail, you no longer have the enforced privacy of the voting booth. So you can check part of it. You're still losing a key privacy property there. Does that make sense? I kind of rushed through that a little bit. I know our ballot got delivered. Yeah. So. So maybe, maybe when you see some of the, the, the work that Ron is presenting this afternoon with some of these paper-based open audit voting schemes, it's possible on paper to get a tracking number that's meaningful, meaning that you're actually going to get to check didn't just get delivered but also got counted properly uh, using some of these techniques. So that part doesn't worry me too much. It's more the, you know, your spouse might influence you, your place of worship might influence you, you know, the, the, you're not in an enforced privacy booth anymore in a vote by mail case. Any other questions? Oh, and I should point out that actually and the company that Andy was with, Vote Here, had actually a system for tracking uh, vote by mail ballots with these kinds of technologies, right? I think I'm not misrepresenting that. The uh, we, we had offered more than one approach to, to what exactly got considered by the state of Washington is a little bit unclear Oh, to sure, me sure. I, I, I'm not talking about what got adopted. I'm saying you had systems proposed systems and architectures and yeah. software to do that, yeah. uh, to, to do the kind of back-end auditing of the vote-by-mail process. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, I'm just, we were dealing very much with the work that you are now doing, which is the you know, education and enlightenment. That's very difficult to get across, or it had been for us to get across the, the differences between these, these various approaches. And some of them have the properties and some of them don't. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. But, hey, I, I, any other questions? I, I, I'm happy to take Andy's. Just, yep, okay, good. So I, I, I've never seen the Edfelt quote before. That's a I, recent quote. I, I'm recent. taking it slightly out of context, uh, especially because it was during a rum session at EVT. So I, to, to do him justice, this was part of, a, of another presentation. But I think I didn't mischaracterize uh, his point, which is that uh, in terms of the privacy and the vote, I don't think he was talking in general in, in privacy. In, in terms of voter privacy, we may be fooling ourselves if we think that we still have voter booth privacy. Uh, um, that would probably be a, a more fair representation of the point he made. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's, it's clear, um, even before I, I got your that initial response from you, that, that the that statement has a weird number of contexts in which it can be interpreted. Yes. So I'm not going to try to say that I know exactly what he was thinking, but I, I'll try to probe a little by, by, by saying um, you know, this is somewhat consistent with the work I've, I've seen Ed Felton do. Um, on the other hand, I've also gotten the impression, um, right or wrong, that he's very much opposed to, to just moving to a full-out bulletin board approach that would be fairly straightforward to implement on the internet, right? So, so I guess I'm trying to understand, you know, this two-sidedness of it, right? I mean, uh, is, it, is, is it his position that, well, We've lost all our voter privacy, deal with it, and so it's okay? Or is it, uh, you know, we've lost all our voter privacy, 
we need to start getting it back. I don't quite understand. I, I again, I, I can't speak for him, so I won't. I won't try to interpret exactly what he said. Uh, it was, again, it was in a, the context of a rum session. I think he was trying to be provocative by saying, if we keep thinking in the scheme that it's, we, all we have to do is enforce voter booth privacy, then we're maybe not in being realistic. I don't think he was necessarily, I certainly don't think he was saying, that's cool, everything's, we're, we're all happy with that situation. I think he was mostly trying to point out that we should be realistic and deal with the evolution of that technology. Okay, I'm standing between you and lunch, so I should stop. Thank you. <laughs>